tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to tinfoil hat. We go deep, homeboy. Aaron, open your mind. Drink. From the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That, 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 that's some you know what I'm here to do. I'm here to. Rah! There we go. Jo- joining me across the table, uh, to know him as I love him, Xavier Guerrero. What's up? And on the ones and twos, Johnny Wooder, Jay Nice. What's happening, dude? Good show today. Good show today. Super yeah. excited. Yeah. Getting into the esoteric, getting into the occult, getting into forbidden technologies. It's a great episode. It's right in your wheelhouse. I, the, the, the episode that get the best feedback from this is the show so um yeah so let's get into some stuff here today i i am going to be in indianapolis this weekend i'm at helium's with my good friend zane helberg okay and so i'm very excited come see me come get weird got a whole bunch of new jokes for you and one of the episodes i will do an opiate for the uh, opiate of the asses um, and that will be where I just do a whole episode, a whole hour on crowd work, talking to you, getting to know you, answering your questions, but grab your tickets now. Just go to Sam I got more dates coming, going out with Eddie Bravo, uh, I believe in the beginning of June. So big things happening. All right. Support the show guys. If you want to support the show, please go to tin fall hat t-shirts, Dot com. That's tinfoilhattshirts.com or samtriplee.com. A lot of great stuff coming up at the com- uh, uh, for us, and we'll get into that in other shows once we know we uh, anything else. All right, guys. Uh, th- no, we just did a broken simulation. If you want to check that out, uh, early edition, you can go to rockfin.com slash broken sim. Oh, and, and uh, um, opiate of the asses is at Sam's. Sam Tripley's YouTube and it's fucking hilarious. I watched it yesterday. Thank so you, dude. Great. Just yeah. me yelling. Right, and it's I, the best. You know, what more do you my need? favorite thing is like, oh, here we go with more racial jokes. <laughs> do you hear anybody ever say that to Chappelle or Chris Rock? Ever? It's so funny, political correctness. It's only a one way avenue. I'm so over people, but enjoy it. And patreon.com slash broken simulation. Okay. Uh, if you want to get the early. Addition to that, it's out, and then the regular show will be out this weekend. Okay, I should make the announcement here. Uh, oh, finally, it's time for the big announcement. Uh, yeah, we're basically come to terms, and I am the new head of comedy at Rockfin. I am in charge of comedy development. Thank you, Swarm. And uh, what basically does that mean for us is that I'm going to be shutting down my Patreon, the Tim Foyle Patreon moving everything to Rockfin and doing everything there. I'm going to be shutting down a lot of stuff on my own website because we've we've made a good deal and I'm going to be everything over there. And what does that mean for everybody? Well, all I got to say is now I am in a position where I can help content creators. And just like all my other shows where I practice the law of abund- the, the the model of abundance and why my my pot my my live shows like comedy chaos always thrived because I, I i i got out of my way and i allowed artists to thrive so now we got in my humble opinion you have a good guy in a position to help good people and that's really what i'm all about i want i'm in a place where con- i'm going to help content creators Make money off their content. And I, I like I love all the savages. I also like all the nerds. I like all the real ones. Okay. I, I, I'm really excited what the future has at Rockfin for art, for for comedy, for content creators. Because I want I want everybody to do well. I want to spread the love and the wealth. 
Model of abundance. Get on there. I'm working with, I'm creating the comedy division and I'm cr- helping them with their spiritual division and their, their truth division. I'm going to be helping at that because I want content creators to thrive. And that's what's going on there. And we're debating on whether we should do just live stream these shows. That's what we're talking about. In, right in vivo? Live? Live. Let's do it. I'm, a, I'm open-minded to it. I live stream it on Rockfin. What does that mean for you? Tim Fall Hat, the main show, will always be free and always be for the people. So you never have to worry about, oh, is he going to charge us for Never. I will never do that. I make that promise to you. I would rather end the show than do that. Tim Fall Hat is for the people, Okay. And it will always be for the people for as long as you guys will listen. So that was the big announcement. And I'll be on, I'll be on Patreon to talk about it. I'm going to shut that down. Because censorship is coming. And I really, really don't want to be on any platform that is telling. Because what eventually happens is on Bimmo, right? Bimmo? Yep, Vimeo. Vimeo. Vimeo, okay. If you don't know, you have to you Patreon does not host video. No. And you have to either upload it to YouTube or Vimeo. Those yes. are the platforms yes. that they will the hosts they'll allow you to use. So, you know, Vimeo will now shut people down. They've done it to my Patreon. They've shut down my Patreon before. A lot of my old videos are no longer on the Patreon because Vimeo shut me down. I'm done with that. And at this moment, Rockfin is all about freedom of speech, free expression. So I'm going to work with them on growing that brand and bringing you guys and helping the content creators you love and you create the best content out there and monetize their content. So, so artists can make a living being artists and focus on art. And guess what? Guess what? Guess what they're doing at at Rockfin? They're bringing all the savages, right? Jimmy Dore, Abby Martin, Lee Camp, and then everybody, you know, all of them are over there. Who are some of your favorite people that have been on the show? Whitney Webb, she's over there. Dude, I never thought Jimmy Dore would have gone over there. I used to watch him every day. When you said he's over there, I was like, no fucking way. He's huge. Yeah, I mean, they're all there, there, dude. And he gets great. He does extra shit on there, too. R-R-O-K-F-I-N. That's, you know. Most importantly, Broken Simulation is over there. Broken Sim is over there. Zero's over there. The greatest of all time, sports talk. The greatest of all time. All of it's there, dude. All of it's there. You go on the free thinking media, right? Or we'll go open mind, open mind. But yeah, if you're going to sign up, for sure sign up through the Broken Simulation page. Uh, because okay. that Let's one's, not go crazy. You can get special privileges if you sign up through that. Oh, and you can tip simulation. there, by the way. If you're being extra little, a little extra nice for us on the live, you can leave a little nice little tip like a super chat. Yeah, man. I mean, there's so many great things. I'm looking forward to that live, though. That'll be fun. Doing it live, so go right to the people. Watching right you, to the people. Watching you try not to say things that... <laughs> That you want Damn. edited out later. No, I will say things. I'm about to say, Johnny. Don't Wizard? you worry about that, bro. It's, I will say something. I will say something. Yeah, it's about to say your talent's gonna go right out the window, Johnny. I mean, You're look great. at this. Jay Dyer's there. Uh uh Chris Charlie Robinson, Scott Adams, Jamie Deluxe. All your favorites are there. Jason Burmese, John, my buddy John Toll. They're all there, dude. They're all there. Tristan Hagar, who I'm trying to do a show with, we're going to set that up. He's there. They're all there. The Black Pill podcast. Abby Martin. I already said her. I mean, they're all there, man. And it's really cool. Isaac Weisip, who we love on the show. I love that guy. Yeah, he's he's great. Got, he, he's got another book out. He's going to come in in studio. They're all there, dude. They're all there. And that's what we need. More of that. More of this. Okay. And that's why I love it, dude. In, look at this, dude. Look at this. Ron Placone has been on the show. Graham Elwood has been on the show. I mean, they're all here, man. And hey. all the people who got kicked off of YouTube and had nowhere to go have now come over here. And guess what? It's not just one side. You can get both sides of the argument, which I think is really important. 
Hey, and for a lot of fucking MMA guys, there's a 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. It's like a Jiu-Jitsu classes. Yeah. They got the whole class. You can uh, watch them roll and shit. So it's not just comedy or free thinking. It's like a, everything. Oh, yeah. They have a ton of sports, though. Yeah. A ton. I mean... Like, uh, like a greatest of all time? Chris Roberts, Chris the Mysterious, is going to be doing a yoga show over there. Richard Medhurts, he's there. I mean, like, it's great. It's great people. They got live stuff. It's all there, dude. Okay? So go check it out. Daddy's going to make sure we pump up the jam and get the best of the best over there. I love you all so much. Thank you so much. There's karaoke over there. What do you want? Uh, There we go. Anything else, guys? No, I think we're rocking. Enjoy the show. It's a good one. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. All right, guys. So let's get into this real quick. Very excited to have this gentleman on. He is a uh, man. He's he is an award winning author of ten books, and he is a spiritual traveler. He's seen all over the world, and uh, we're very honored honored to have him on the show. Please welcome Brad Olson. How are you, sir? <laughs> Hey guys, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on Tin Foil Hat Podcast. It's a real honor to be here and talk with you and uh, keep it light and humorous because this is kind of a, a humor show and uh, really happy to join you today. Well, we're we're honored to have you. I have a little deja vu right now. I don't know why, but uh, I want to, before we get into your books and stuff like that, I want to ask you a question. Even though we know the conspiracy theorist term is a little weird, um, I get told, asked by all of my, we'll say, for lack of a better word, conformist theorist or phrase, uh, is everything a conspiracy? I mean, I I tell them, yeah, it is. What are your thoughts? Well. The term conspiracy theory was concocted by the CIA in the 1960s during the Warren Commission as it was looking into the Kennedy assassination. So anytime I hear someone use that term, I'm thinking either they're really ignorant or they're not really aware the amount of manipulation the CIA has had on our mainstream media, as well as the general narrative in this country. Is everything a conspiracy? Well, let's define the term. What is a conspiracy? That is just two or more people concocting an idea in private and making it work. So uh, before this video goes live, we're actually conspiring in a conspiracy right here uh, to, to, to talk about it. So it's it, it just very disingenuous when people use that term conspiracy theorists because uh, it, it, it is a way to deflect truth seekers from getting close to what really matters in the world. And I certainly don't use it myself. I think a better term is conspiracy researcher or just um, a truth seeker, but uh, not everything in the world's a conspiracy, but there are conspiracies in the world. There's no doubt about that. I am. Uh, I, I like the term spiritual skeptic. That's kind of what I'm into. Uh, that kind of makes me feel good about myself. But I, I, uh, I, I do believe that you're right. Not everything's a conspiracy, but there is a lot of work be- being done behind closed doors for sure. <clears throat> so let's get let's get into a little bit about you. Uh, well, and, and uh, everything you do. For those who don't know you that well, Brad, <clears throat> or may not be familiar with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. Well, I'm a Chicago native. <clears throat> Grew up there and went to college, Illinois State University. But when all my uh, fellow colleagues in school were going to career day, I'm playing hacky sack and frisbee in the quad. <laughs> I go, what's the hurry to start a career, guys? Instead, I uh, self-financed all my travels and started by uh, painting houses in uh, the suburbs of Chicago and went backpacking around Europe uh, right after I finished school. And I thought it was really cool backpacking around, paying my own way, seeing uh, all the great sites in Europe. And then I start meeting these uh, Aussies and Kiwis, and they be like, you've been on the road for three months, mate? We've been on the road for three years. (laughs) It's like, how do you do that? 
say, you work your way around the world. And so I took that to heart. And a couple of years later, I had the time and the money and desire. My first book is called World Stompers, a Global Travel Manifesto. It's it's still in print. And uh, that's basically my uh, testimony, how to take a trip around the world on your own budget. And so I taught English in Japan, and then I self-financed a uh, in total three year trip around the world. And boy, I'll tell you, that was about as educational and eye opening as my uh, five years in college. And uh, it then paved the way for my career starting as a travel writer and doing a series of books on sacred places. Then about uh, 15 years ago, a bit of an existential crisis in my career because the internet was changing everything as we know it, as far as uh, travel publishing goes, because all of a sudden you could just look on the internet and start to make up your own itinerary and collect information that you can get from the internet without having to pay for a book. So I don't know if you remember about 20 years ago, the travel aisle was uh, very large, oftentimes several aisles. Now it's very much condensed to maybe uh, 50 or so different book titles in one small section. So at that point, I was thinking to myself, well, what, what, if I want to stay in publishing, if I want to stay relevant as a writer, what, what do I need to get into? And, and it occurred to me that what I'm very passionate and interested in are these esoteric subjects. And so about 10 years ago, uh, just came out with the first book in the three book series. It's modern esoteric the book one future esoteric book two, and just recently released beyond esoteric escaping prison planet. And, uh, that has been a, a very fortuitous subtitle and it opens up a lot of questions exactly what is prison planet and how does one escape from it? And I would certainly love to hear your take on escaping prison planet, because I do this with a lot of my interviews and I'll tell you every single one of the answers is very divergent. What exactly that means. Um, but to me, it means exploring these subjects that are, uh, often conspiracy driven, but, um, Esoteric by its nature means understood by a select few. So in the context of beyond esoteric, this is the age we live in when a lot of things are, are even going beyond the pale of what any 19th century occultist could ever imagine the world we live in today in the second decade of the 21st century. Uh, I find it all so interesting. So to basically answer your question, uh, about, you know, the prison plan and stuff like that. You know, if you were asking me, I would tell you that, that we live in a realm. It's something I talk about a lot on this show. We live in, a, this is some sort of realm. Whatever the realm is, we, that's, that's, can be discussed. You know, I, I believe this, wherever we live is so special. It is what you want it to be. Meaning whatever you see, however you see it as it becomes the reality. And, you know, I mean, some people want to get flat earth. Some people want to get into Ron Ball, space, all that stuff. I I personally believe, based on the years of doing this show and talking to so many people from so many disciplines, that this realm that we live in can take the form of whatever you want it to be and that you can find all the information you want to support your idea on what this reality is. And then I could talk to somebody else and they can find all the information they want to prove that their argument on what, what we are, where we live and all that stuff uh, is, is true. And then you'll leave there going, well, if they both have really good points. I have no clue what it is. And maybe that's the key to everything is, to the true knowing is not knowing, right? It's like having an idea of what it might be and then going through that. Now, obviously, you have been around the world. You would have a far better expertise on all that stuff. And I'm not necessarily here to get into any kind of flat earth, round ball kind of kind of discussion. I kind of I'm really enjoying the esoteric angle and the 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 occult angle of this. But if you're asking me what I think a prison plan is, this is a realm 
We're here to learn. This realm has suffering. You cannot legislate and outlaw suffering because that is the point of being here, is that you are here to learn lessons about how the universe works, and we are all part of this universe, and we are the universe self-actualizing. I always butcher that word, word um, and that's kind of my opinion on it, so if you're asking me. Guys, Mother's Day is here, and you know we uh, we all end up doing the same thing: buying flowers, taking them to eat. That's great, but if you really love your mother, maybe you should think about Hello Tushy. That's right. Mom needs a bidet on her Mother's Day. Would you do that, Johnny? Absolutely. How I about would. you, dude? She cleaned my ass my whole life. Yeah. I have to pay her back. Yeah, let her fucking run it up there, bro. <laughs> Seriously, man, take care of your mom with a brand new Hello Tushy 3.0. Modern bidet attachment. It's stylish. It's eco-friendly, easy to install, and man, helps stop flushing her retirement down the toilet with toilet paper. I mean, dude, why do we spend so much money on toilet paper? We have the technology to clean our bee holes, okay? Cheaper, faster, stronger, okay? I definitely get my mom one. My mom held my hand when I was a boy, when I had to have a difficult movement, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Why would I not pay her back? Of your course mom was there when you were dropping deuce, and you should be there when your mom drops a deuce, and you could do that with it's, the it's new Tushy 3.0 bidet, man! Do it together, man. You're dead. And you know, dad's going to use it and he needs a real power wash down there. And but that's what Hello Tushy wash. is about. Okay. Okay. And it's, you got to get the spa. You can't be cold water all the time. Yeah. Sometimes. Clean it up. Now, listen, guys. It's you're thinking like, Sam, this is crazy ideas. Well, guess what? The, every Hello Tushy attachment comes with a 60-day free guarantee and 12-month warranty. Dude, 60 days of power washing your b-hole. Okay. For something that washes your butt, you get For a 60-day guarantee. That's crazy. You get, you get 60 day free rod just to feel if you like it, okay? How great is that? Mom already got, okay? Listen, your mom deserves it. If you love your mother, you'll get her a bidet. For Mother's Day, and this one's going to have to give the gift of a clean butt. Go to hellotushy.com slash tinfoil to get 10% off plus free shipping. 10% off plus free shipping. Okay, this is a special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash tinfoil for 10% off. Okay, just go to hellotushy.com slash tinfoil. Happy Mother's Day, Mama. Uh, thank you. That's a great answer, and I love it. Very divergent from other hosts that have also taken a shot at answering what is Prison Planet and how does one escape from it. And indeed, we're all here on a, a journey, I would say a karmic journey of our own making. That's why we've been incarnated here and we all have our lessons to learn and our journey to take. And it's really how we go along that path defines who we are as people and and if we're going to get it or not it, it is a great awakening period for humanity and it's really a wonderful time to be alive and watch it happen and i'll tell you I, I have traveled around the world i've been to all seven continents now and i'll tell you this is a gem of a planet it is so beautiful and so worth preserving uh and so many different cultures and the ruins that you can find uh, it would take uh, many lifetimes to see it all and, and I've just really scratched the surface by uh, pretty much spending my young adult life and middle age adult life traveling to far flung places around this world. And it's really a, an ocean planet. A lot of people don't uh, realize that the surface is covered by uh, 79% is ocean, uh, only uh, 20 well, it depends if you count uh, the, the ice covering of the Arctic and the Antarctic. And the Antarctic uh, is very much an ice-covered continent year-round. Um, in, in those ways of measuring it, it's about uh, 29% covered with a physical surface. But it's really an ocean planet. And when you view it from the bottom of the Southern Hemisphere up into the Pacific Basin, there are images of the globe where you hardly see any land at all. Just sort of right away on the outskirts is the, the Ring of Fire continents and, and New Zealand and bottom Antarctica. So a lot of misconceptions about uh, the world we live in. 
um, and, and as well as the aging of the cultures, how some of these cultures, such in South America, where I was just visiting, uh, everything gets dated older and older and older. Same with the pyramids, same with uh, even Angkor Wat are evidence that uh, these temples were built upon other temples. And so this is esoteric information uh, for, for those who seek it out. Some don't find it very interesting. I find it very fascinating. This is like the story of our planet Earth. And the more I learn, the the, the bigger the puzzle all comes together for me. And, and that's why I write these big 480 page books to try to help people also uh, be inquisitive and look into the inner workings of the world. Not only that, but also I get into um, exopolitics, the ET relationship with this earth. And that's what we're talking about, dude. That's what we're talking about. I'm all about that action, man. I'm all about (laughs) that. And, you know, I think that the what you discuss and and is is so important to people, and it's you know it's esoteric for a reason. There's a small group of people that know about this, and there's small people who study it, and it's not generally known by the masses. And I think that has been done uh, purposefully because the the information that you've learned and put in your books and I haven't read them yet but I look forward to reading some of your books is that um for me it's just like it, if people get this knowledge then they start to realize how special they are how special we are how special this planet is and then it changes kind of this thing that I've been studying which is abundance versus scarcity and uh, they start living in abundance instead of living out of out of scarcity and in fear and, and uh, scare of de- fear of death and all this stuff that is pounded into us as we're very young that you know that we're just speck of meat suits on rocks and we got one shot at this and if and if if we die then it's over and we just are done and that's and we we don't exist for the rest of eternity and I, I don't believe any of that and you know when you start talking about ancient cultures you know building on top of ancient cultures this throws timelines all off this this exp- you know people think we're the smartest we've ever been are we because i think there's technology that says that we've been very smart many different times and why aren't those societies and those civilizations still here and all that to me leads into how important where we live is and how special each one of us is what are your guys thoughts on this i just think that we're smart but i think they were smart as well and like a different kind of smart like, yeah. yeah, like I don't think they had iPhones, but I think we obviously can't build a pyramid. Yeah, like, I mean, they might have, smart. they just might have other ways of communicating that is beyond even a higher level than an iPhone. Well, I mean, you think about what it's tech, I mean, it's the old saying, it's like uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Three Laws. I think any technology sufficiently advanced appears, you know, magic to, to us. And I, I think a lot of the things we may be seeing in the historical record. Are that are kind of confounding to us are actually technology that we just don't recognize as technology, possibly. No, I I, I agree with that. Uh, I want to get into some stuff that this, uh, you know you went to Antarctica. Let's talk about <laughs> Antarctica. That is a very hot topic here. You know I don't know if you saw the movie, but uh, you know Godzilla versus King <laughs> Kong. I know some people are like. Oh, my God. Why do you bring that movie up with this guy who's written 10 books? But, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk of hollow earth, of firmament, uh, you know, Nephilims. There's so – somebody who wrote that script Listen to a uh, – there's a conspiracy podcast in the movie. Right? Uh, tugboat just went by. Um, but – I mean, there's so, and like Antarctica, he goes to Antarctica. Antarctica is, I think, a giant piece of this puzzle. What do you, where do you want to start on Antarctica? What was it like? Sure. Yeah. I I took a sailboat down there of all ways to go. (laughs) Most people take a cruise ship and, uh, even 50% of people on cruise ships get seasick. And, uh, 
on our boat of 14, um, 10 of us got violently ill. I think I lost about 25 pounds uh, going over the Drake Passage. So it was basically from the Argentinian southernmost city of the world called Ushuaia. We caught this sailboat and it took us 92 hours until we got to the, uh, the first island. And boy, it was just really rough. It was, uh, I'm not kidding when I say the waves were about three stories tall. Now, not crashing waves, not, and some of them did hit our boat and get us wet, but just undulating up and down these massive tumblers. And um, it was, it, we were very grateful when we finally made it. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, she didn't think we were going to make it, but I said, look, as long as the boat's not taking on water, we're going to do it. So it was pretty hairball. Uh, and, and that's probably why so very few people ever go down there because the barrier of entry is very rough. Um, it's not like you're going there on a, a honeymoon or something like that, unless you're pretty tight as a couple. Um, oh, yeah. Broken up. Imagine if you're working on freaking relationship issues as you're trying to get to Antarctica. You don't love it's me enough. You're not talking to me enough. <laughs> yeah, you're throwing up. You got to tell her she looks good in those jeans. It's got to be a rough one. It's got to be a rough. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage I've ever tried, okay? With so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our body the nutrition nutrients it needs to thrive, okay? Busy schedule, poor sleep, exercise, stress, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, okay? This is where Athletic Greens can help, okay? Their daily all-in-one superfood powder is your nutritional essentials, okay? It is by far the easiest, most delicious nutritional habit that you can can add to your health routine today and empower you to take over your health okay own your health ownership of your health that's what we're talking about i can't recommend this enough to friends or family okay one tasty scoop of athletic greens contains 75 vitamins minerals and whole food source ingredients including a multivitamin multi-mineral probiotic green foods blend and more that all work together to fill in the gaps in your diet, okay? Increase your energy and your focus, aid with digestion, and supports a healthy immune system, all without having to take multiple vitamins, multiple products, okay? So this is what what's going on right now, dude, okay? Right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during these spring months, okay? They are offering my audience free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packets with your first purchase. If you visit my link today, you're basically never have to buy vitamin D again. Okay. I just tell all my friends, all my family, I drink this every day, every morning, kickstarts my day, getting my multi, uh, my nutritional greens and getting my multivitamin, multimillion, probiotic, superfood to kick off the day. All right. I tell all my family and friends to do it. So this is what I need you to do. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash tinfoil and join health experts, athletes, conspiracy podcasters, and health conscious go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash tinfoil and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packets today. So you get to Antarctica. What it, what was that feeling like? Obviously, you were you were thankful to get through the chaos. But as you arrived there, what was that feeling? Well, when we weren't throwing up or incapacitated in our bunks, uh, we were asked to be part of the crew, and that is helping with the watch. So we'd have to go up on the deck to watch out for icebergs. And, in fact, that was the first thing we saw were just these massive chunks of ice that had broken off from the shelves, uh, big as – 30 story building. If you know the um, merchandise mart in downtown Chicago, where I grew up, uh, this just massive building on the Chicago river. That's what it reminded me of the size of that. So we saw these icebergs. That was the first thing. And then finally we started seeing some islands. um, And and then we landed, we dropped anchor at on uh, King George Island. And there was a base there that was, uh, Polish base called Arktowski, and and we were on a Polish vessel 
from Gdansk, Poland, called the Chief One. Eleven Poles and three Americans. And so we were we already set up that we would go ashore the next morning. And boy, were we grateful when they welcomed us in. They allowed us to take a shower after four days and throwing up most of the time. I can't tell you how good that felt. And a warm meal. And then we befriended them. And because we brought fresh fruit and vegetables for their chef. And so they were grateful to have that. And then we were so grateful to have a, a stepping onto shore. I can't tell you how, uh, what a luxury that is when you're at on rough seas for four days to just walk on terra firma. So it was, the, the trip was mainly going around to these different research stations. It was going to penguin colonies, which by the thousands of these animals, um, animals have no fear of humans down there, which is a really interesting thing. We'd ha- had uh, whales swimming under our boat who are just as interested in seeing us as we were them. Same with like the seals and, and of course the penguins by the thousands are saying was you could smell it before you could see it. So you'd smell these penguin <laughs> colonies because they defecate right there in their, in their little zone. And then you'd see them way up on the hillside too. That was another thing. I was like, how the heck did they get way up there? And they just find a little path and just climb up these very steep cliff walls sometimes and, get a little perch and that's where they have their chicks. So they're safe from predators and there are large uh, birds that will prey upon the penguins. So really it was just the, the starkness of a frozen continent. Um, at times we would uh, observe the glaciers collapsing and that would create a mini tidal wave. So we'd have to steer our boat right into it. So the trip was wrought with danger uh, just about every day, there was just some kind of new challenge that we had to make. But fortunately, some of the the Polish uh, sub captain, he was a young guy and he was a risk taker. So he would he would be like, "What do you guys want to do?" And we would get on the dinghy and go out and whale watch or uh, jump on uh, glaciers, which isn't recommended. They can sometimes tumble, but we got away with it. And here's another cool thing. When we were in the Polish base, they said, well, we're going to have some cocktails. You guys want to join us? Well, of course. And they brought out this blue ice, bluish white ice. We're like, wow, what's that? And they said, it's from the glaciers. It's very old. When you see ice that is that blue, it's from the glaciers. So they chopped it up, put it in our glass. And when they poured the whiskey in there, it just started popping like popcorn. And it's these little air bubbles that have accumulated in the glacial ice that create that effect so there's there's just all these little details about being down there that's that's really weird but of course i collect esoteric information and i'm i'm very interested in um the nazi base down there called new schwabenland this is a map in beyond esoteric. there we go new schwabenland yeah. here we are yeah, cooking with gas here uh, we are yeah. <laughs> new schwabenland i'm uh we're very interested in that very in- Were there any women stationed there, by the way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, there at, at the Polish base, it was about half women. They were down there studying a uh, penguin colony, which was right there next to the base, that had all three different species of penguins in that area. So it was kind of unique that they would all coexist Wow, uh, fairly close to together wow. and then the women would they usually people would sign up for a year either they're there for a, the full year including the antarctic winter which is not enviable place to be during all those months of darkness or you would just go for the season which is basically feb uh november till the end of february or march so just those f- four or five months and then you want to get out of there it gets so cold and the, the storms kick up that um, to, to stay there for the whole season takes a certain kind of personality. In fact, there were stories when we were down there about people who were assigned that didn't want to be. And there was this doctor from uh, Chile, and he, he says, I'm not going to stay this season. They're like, well, too bad, boat's leaving. And he burned down the base. He wanted to leave that bad. that what? he burned down the base so they would 
get them out of there. Yeah, so they showed us the remains of the old base that the doctor burned down. Of course, they rebuilt another one, but uh, people get desperate. And, um, of course, loneliness and uh, not being able to see the sun. You know, in, at the South Pole, the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, four months of pitch black darkness. Can you imagine not seeing the sun for four months That's and crazy. being in an extremely cold climate that you just walk outside, every part of your body has to be covered. If there's just one little leak uh, the getting through to your skin, you could get a uh, frostbite within Whoa. minutes. Damn, so it's a very damn. dangerous environment too. I love it. I mean, like, I, I, would you want to go there? No. It's, no. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely like, part no. of me is like, <laughs> ah, and I'm like, nah, you know, it's just, it would be interesting. You know, you want to see the world, but do you want to see that part of the world? Can I just watch a YouTube video <laughs> yeah. on it, right? Props to the women that are out there. But shout out to the ladies. Yeah. All the Antarctica At ladies. the bottom of the ocean. I, it's cool. <laughs> don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid of sharks, so I don't even want to get near that stuff. Yeah, but yeah. Um, So let's get into the new Schwabenland, because I find this as the most interesting stuff in the world. I've had a lot of debates about Nazis and what they represent. My my, I'm starting to form a theory that the Nazis didn't lose the war. Germany did, and Nazis and Antarctica and aliens and the deals being made and the effect that it has on today and what we're dealing with and Schwab and land and Schwab. Um, so let's get into this. Where do we start with Nazis in Antarctica? Sure. Well, let, let's start with the new Schwab and land region, which is directly South of South Africa. And that particular area is very much, um, it's called Queen Maud Land on maps today. And um, it basically was claimed by the Third Reich in late 1930s. Because Is that Commissioner it Gordon? Was, yeah, <laughs> because it was, uh, well, it was, it, there is a relic inland within the claim of New Schwabenland that I bring up in my presentation that could be one of the three large crafts that are known down there. And the, the NSA call them, the nickname is the Nina Pinta in Santa Maria. So I think they had discovered this uh, craft under the ice, which you can see in Google Earth if you go back to the year 2013, and they were doing an excavation there. Uh, the remote viewers from the uh, Farsight Institute have also looked at this craft and they say it's it's certainly nothing natural made. It's some kind of massive craft, very, very old, and incidentally built for very tall uh, individuals that had occupied that craft. So oh my uh, I think God. the Nazis found out about this. Yeah. Yeah. And there are uh, other locations under the ice where these crafts will uh, open up a hole and you can... You can see them. It's very hard to go there because you need clearance. And the distances are vast in Antarctica, so it's, it's hard to get around. It's also very expensive to get around. But for the most part, you are allowed to travel inland to locations that you know of. So if I were ever to go back, I would want to go to New Schwabenland with a film crew and to investigate the new Berlin base is what it was called, or Base 211. Um, and this is where uh, it, it's presumed a lot of the scientists that were backward engineering Nazi technology went down, and they had U-boat submarines that were larger than a, a container, as we know them today on the container ships. So it's quite plausible that they were partially disassembled, put into these larger uh, transport U-boats and taken down there. Well, we knew about it. And, and some of the other bases that we traveled to on our trip uh, were used by the Brits to spy on the Nazis during the war and even after the war. And the U.S. knew that uh, the Nazis had fled down there, as well as to South America and other locations around the world. But this was of particular interest because this is where they were taking their uh, very high technology. 
to stash it away in, in the impregnable fortress in a faraway land, uh, Shangri-La, as Admiral Dolence, the uh, top admiral of the U-boats, called it. And so they brought it down there, and then our uh, Admiral Byrd put together Operation High Jump to go and confront them. And it was a huge armada of ships of other countries as well. They get down there. Uh, day one, they're doing some recognizance. They found point two eleven. They they dropped some ordinances. They went back the next day to do a much heavier bombing. And all those planes just dropped from the radar, never to be heard or seen again. On that same day was the Battle of High Jump. And that's when these crafts came out of the water confronted the armada they couldn't be shot down they sliced one of the boats in half and i've even gone so far as to talk to a marine salvage company about trying to hunt down the uss murdoch because then again would be evidence that the battle of high jump occurred and that's why admiral bird had to turn around that expedition two months into the six month journey and leave because of this confrontation at sea right off of New Schwabenland. Well, fast forward to 10 years later, and we, the U.S. military is doing top secret atomic bomb testing called uh, Operation Argus. And it, too, happened to be right off the coast of New Schwabenland. And they were basically sending nuclear bombs high up into the atmosphere. This is the cover story to, um, to basically poke a hole in the uh, ozone layer. That's uh, alternative one. And here's a picture in the book of some of those nuclear missiles that were going up in um, were they operation. Hitting a Argus. Firmament? Or do you think they were trying to hit the firmament? Well, that, that's the cover story. If you look on uh, Wikipedia, it'll tell you, yeah, and this is still a top secret atomic bomb testing program. But what I think they were really doing was hurling some nukes over at the uh, New Berlin base to put an end to that uh, base once and for all. And so what's Whoa. really interesting is that right after this happened in 1958, the original articles for the Antarctica Treaty were formulated. And one of the top points was that there would be no nuclear testing or nuclear bomb activity whatsoever on the Antarctic continent. Well, that's interesting because if nothing's ever happened, why would you have to make such a big point of it never happening again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it happened then. So if I were to go back, I would like to go down with some Geiger counters and to, uh, to take a look and maybe examine, try to find it. I think I know the location of the New Berlin base. It is within walking distance of the Schumacher ponds, which are these geothermal ponds that never freeze. And, uh, Antarctica is the most volcanic continent in the world. There's 91 known volcanoes. There are several fault lines that travel through the continent, including one that goes right through New Schwabenland and then up the uh, North Atlantic Ridge, which is underwater, but is also very volcanically active. Wow. So that, that's the part of Antarctica that I'm totally fascinated with. I think I am, too. I think I am too. I mean, there's so much. There's discussion of um, of you know Bird going back, telling Eisenhower what he saw. Eisenhower somewhat freaking out. Then there becomes the discussion of like, is there a deal made? And you know, so let's just say, let's just let's okay, let's say for a second this isn't true. Right. Let's just say, and I, I believe everything you're saying. That's it is of my opinion. What you're saying is correct, but let's just say it's not correct. Why, why would the U S government bring Nazi scientists to the United States? Why would they bring war criminals? If we're, if we're working a pure heart here, why would they bring, <laughs> bring Nazi scientists who have committed atrocities in Germany to America to live freely. 
people like Von Braun who had been found guilty and sentenced to death, why would they suddenly bring them over? Doesn't really make sense. However, if we go on the assumption that the Nazis didn't lose the war, Germany did, and that this deal that they had with the aliens kind of like put Eisenhower in a bad spot and it's either like work with us or we just fucking annihilate everything. Um, now the Nazis aren't brought over. The Nazis stroll over and become right. part of everything. Well, I have a chapter in uh, Beyond Nazis. Esoteric called American Nazis. And isn't it interesting that only 19 of the top Nazis were put on trial at the Nuremberg trials? It should have been hundreds. Hundreds, dude. Hundreds. hundreds perhaps thousands. Yeah. Uh, but it was only 19. Yeah. And um, there's a great TV series called Hunting Hitler. Yep. And they go all over South America and around the world. And I went to a lot of those locations on the South America portion of my trip, driving down and back from uh, Ushuaia. And I went to many of these locations. And I've been to Germany many times. I'm half German, half Norwegian myself with some uh, distant relatives still down in uh, the Bohemia region. Um, and... I tell you, some of these towns in Argentina, it's like you're, you're walking into a Bavarian town in uh, San Carlos de Barloche to La Falda, where the Eden Hotel is, where a lot of these escaped Nazis went to. And, and you hit the nail on the head there when you said that uh, the Third Reich never surrendered after World War II. The fighting forces of the German army surrendered after World War II, but the rest went underground. And I think this is a, a big part of our history in this country and, and world history that is yet to be told and fully understood by people that, um, that this force had left. And look, um, the money man, Martin Bormann, he kept popping up all over South America in the 1950s. He was the number two in charge with Hitler, who I don't think died in the bunkers in 45 either. We'll get into that because I want to talk to you too. about that. Yeah, I want to get into that, but stay on everybody down there. I, I want to okay. get into that, but it's like the it's basically were, the Fourth Reich, right? Is that where like the Fourth Reich right. what it, like came over here? And basically took over. So, so we look at the forties, fifties. They're 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 starting to uh, implement their plans behind closed doors, right? The sixties right. become when the plans get implemented. And just think of all the chaos that came from the sixties. Think of how the how the world was be in the fifties, and then what happened in the sixties, and how we see kind of the birth of these cultures. Now, again, yeah. we're, we're, we're not like feminist culture, uh, black culture, all this culture. Now, in their idealistic forms, they're wonderful things, right? But if these are ideas hatched in think tanks funded by Nazis, like we see the, a change in, the, you know, the hippie culture introduces acid and drugs and everything to um to to our country the feminist culture introduces this movement that kind of somewhat begins to uh, array, uh, erode at the family unit and it's and it's not the feminism black culture uh any other culture you want to come up with are bad because honestly civil rights in itself is a wonderful thing we all want to live as equals, right? They're, we're not talking about that. But we're talking about, like, what is the long game with some of this stuff? And the long game is is to destroy a fabric of how we are as people. This beginning of divide and conquer, which becomes the 60s. And we talk about, and we do this a lot in the show, the occult symbolism behind these high-impact events which becomes what the Nazis love to do, which is dark arts occult, man. And that's my yeah. honest belief. Yeah, well, it's more than a belief. It's, it's based on 
facts and evidence. You know why MK Ultra is spelled MK for mind control? That's the German spelling, Controle with K. They brought those oh, scientists over here too. And those MK Ultra uh, psychologists, which have been largely responsible for the mass dosing of America as well as the uh, mass media mind control, has been very uh, afflicting on our country in many different ways, uh, not only the horrible experiments that were conducted on people against their will oftentimes, but the mass hypnosis through the media. And now we know through Operation Mockingbird that the largest media organizations have been infiltrated with CIA. CIA was co-founded by these paperclip Nazis. There was a guy named Reinhard Galen, who was very high-ranking general that basically should have been on the Nuremberg trials. But no, we whisked him over here and gave him a new life, uh, a new title, a high-paying job, and he was one of those who helped start the CIA. So you have this infiltration of these paperclip Nazis in all these high developmental agencies, including NASA, Werner von Braun, Herman Obereth, were SS Nazis. There's a picture of uh, Werner von Braun in my book, Future Esoteric, wearing his SS uniform. They were very much into the occult. They were very much into a lot of these uh, esoteric sciences that could have helped the uh, Third Reich win the war, but they were outnumbered and they didn't get their wonder weapons online in time. Had the Nazis just had six more months, the tide of the war could have turned in their favor and Europe could be all speaking German right, right, right now. It was very, very close. And the allies knew it when they were coming in uh, on Normandy and, and then invading Germany that uh, they had these wonder weapons. That's what they were called. Not, not only the V-1 and the V-2 rockets. Look, the Germans were the first to develop rocket technology, and, th and those scientists came over here, too, and helped Werner von Braun with the Mercury and the Apollo rocket missions. <clears throat> but I think that the bigger story is how they infiltrated into uh, corporations, into governmental agencies, and we're part of this uh, manipulation. So it's been a, a slow, gradual infestation of this uh, fascist ideology ever since the late 1940s. Now, of course, many of those original Nazis have passed away, but the ideology continues on. And that's why the first section of Beyond Esoteric is called neo-fascism, because we're seeing the effects of all of that continue in the world today i uh i can see i you know i i as this show gets bigger even though they try to tell me the numbers aren't going up but i i know they are um i you know i i sit here and i i, I get on twitter and I, I get in these tweeter twit wars with people and one thing <laughs> is about you know fascism and what is fascism you know and like no so many people don't know what actual fascism is. They they just think it's a bunch of dudes with pointy hats goose-stepping, and that, to them, is fascism. But to me, is a fascism is a concentration of power by a very small few to control you, uh, so many things, including economics your ability to make money and that comes when that comes how with them working with giant corporations so a big part of fascism is when government and and corporations come together to control you and that is straight up what is happening with these vaccine passports and when right. when joe biden's press secretary saying the government is going to lead this the private sector is going to lead the, the development passports vaccine passports okay but who's going to enforce that you have that passport dude it's not going to be burger king it's not going to be chuck e cheese 
It's going to be the U.S. government in, for, in, in, in the form of police and military. That, am I wrong, Brad, is fascism. Am I off on that? No, you're not at all. And that is the, uh, the terminology. When we were in school, remember we learned about Mussolini and, and Hitler being heads of government who would bring in corporations to create this, this uh, fascism we learned about in school. Well, now it's the other way around. Now it is the head of corporations that have the governments bought and paid for and working for them. So that, that's why I call it neo-fascism. It's a new form, but it's still, uh, you put pig on a lipstick, but it's still a pig mm-hmm. kind of thing. And this is what's really uh, the biggest problem in the world today is because they don't have to say mandatory Franken jab. Uh, they can just have their corporate uh, overseers make those mandates themselves. And so the politicians can step back from that and not feel like they're going to be blamed if something goes wrong or if uh, people have backlashes to the mandatory uh, jabs. But you will see that it will take place in many other ways, such as now uh, flying with the travel passport. It hasn't happened in this country yet, but it's happening elsewhere and it will be coming here soon. Uh, And like I said, maybe just stepping into uh, a Burger King or going to go grocery shopping, they're going to make you prove that you've gotten it. It's so, so ridiculous. We're, we're just wait till you got to Yeah, we're Just wait till you need a vaccine to vote. Moment. That's going to happen. Wait till you got to need yeah. a vaccine to vote. But That's you don't next. need an ID. That's next. <laughs> Right? You don't need ID to vote, but you need a vaccine ID yep. to vote. How, how are they going to do? pull that one off? If vaccines were out a year before, I guarantee you, you would have needed a vaccine to vote for this so, election. So when we talk about a lot of this stuff, what we're talking about, I'd like for me, man, and I've said this before, this is not about money. This is not about power. This to me is spiritual. It's all yeah. spiritual. And it's meant to lower our free Because this realm we live in, that is the war. These, I call them satanic, pedophile, dark arts, cultists, okay? They, even though I don't think Satan exists, I think it's all a cult, you know? And the, and the term occult means hidden. And they're not hidden anymore. No. To me, they're more secret. It's secret societies that we know about. That's basically what a secret society is now. We know about your secret society. That's what the internet has done. But it's these people waging war against us who are the universe. That, and this is, their, this is this realm in this dimension. Uh, tell me your thoughts on basically that. Like, what is the universe? Is the universe alive? What is your thoughts on that? Yeah, I cover the holographic universe in Future Esoteric, second book in the series. And that's about the only way I can find any kind of middle ground with flat earthers is that we do live in, in this holographic reality that uh, things are not as they appear. But I think the bigger picture is we, we live in a multidimensional universe. And this is now how we could segue into the extraterrestrial question. Because you know how we've always been taught or trained to look to the sky and they're, they're going to be coming down from the heavens above. But those are extraterrestrials, extra outside of our planet. But what about right here below our feet? What about the inner terrestrials oh. that may have been here for a very long time? And then when you talk about multidimensional beings, ultra terrestrials that can even phase in and out of our third dimensional reality because they're multidimensional beings. So th- this is, this is the conversation that I think we should really be having when we talk about uh, ETs is that they are of a life form and of a consciousness that we really are just beginning to understand. And if they have been here uh, for many, many millennia, as some would uh, say in, in some of these legacy bases, such as Dulce, uh, even Mount Shasta, the city of Talos. And I'll be speaking at the uh, 
Mount Shasta Summer Conference at the end of <laughs> August. Anybody want to go, use promo code BRAD and you'll get a discount. Done. Uh, and, and we're going to be talking about these kind of things we're right there in the shadow of Mount Shasta. And boy, I tell you, if you've never seen uh, crafts coming and going, <laughs> go up near Mount Adams or Mount Shasta. And I'll tell you, if you do a night view, you will start to see things coming and going from these mountains. It's just incredible. So they've been here for a long time and uh, they have their own agenda. Some are good or benevolent and, and want to see humans ascend and others have their own agenda service to self. And they're the ones responsible for the abductions and the cattle mutilations and things like that. So it's, it's a very uh, intricate web out there of different species and different agendas. And it's all, condescending right here on planet earth and uh, this Here's, is a great time to be alive but uh it's also a little bit on the edge because it could flip either way i uh, i see our realm as like uh uh a royal rumble at, at, at wrestlemania <laughs> where just like dude just come running out you're like oh my god it's the ant people from middle earth right and they come in and then oh my god it's shape-shifting jesus he's and they all just come in and it's just like everything you've ever seen in the movies all going on at one time like royal rumble combined with mortal Kombat. yeah That's dude really it's totally that like i really believe that <laughs> and you know brad is someone very unique because he's opened up he's unlocked these levels right not everybody's unlocked these levels to use a video He's also game been tool. everywhere. You, you, you need a little bit of that. You need to leave your house. Well, to... no, but he's also done the research into it. Yes, the traveling has helped. Yeah. You know, he's one of those people. I want to get him on a show with Brian Callen, watch him just mind melt Brian Callen. Uh, <clears throat> but I think this realm is everything you've seen in the movies all in one place on a, on a large level, on a small level. And it's just like there's stuff below and there's stuff be there's stuff above and there's stuff below. And it's so unique. And there's a reason why you can't see it all the time. Because it's 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 levels you haven't unlocked. And you know, and particularly when you live in the big city, there's there's so much weird energy going on, it doesn't allow you to see the things that maybe you would see out there in Mount Shasta and stuff like that. I mean, you're getting into Middle Earth here, man. What is your thoughts yeah. on Middle Earth? And what what and what is the research that has led you to believe in Middle Earth? Mm. Well, let, let's just define our terms again. Middle Earth could just be underground bases, such as deep underground military bases. Um, it more is what has been these legacy bases in my belief. And it's also the massive hole in the ice in Antarctica, which by the way, there is a no fly zone over that area, just, uh, not too far from the South pole itself. And the NSA operate out of the South pole station. They also have a building at McMurdo that nobody can go into. Nobody knows what's going on in there, but it's run by the NSA, the no such agency, <laughs> which were formed to deal with the extraterrestrial issue. It was set up by Truman back in the late 1940s to handle anything extraterrestrial. So all the crash retrievals, bodies, uh, even communication, uh, with with extraterrestrials, but as far as inner Earth, I mean, we're, we're talking about many things which are um, legendary, such as Shangri La or Agartha, um, some of these high civilizations of very advanced beings, including what's under Mount Shasta in Telos. Um, so to to explore that is also part of exopolitics. Is what are these and entities doing here um as well as on uh, the, in the nellis air force base where area 51 is on one side and just over the mountain mm -hmm. range yep. is s4 which is an underground base which houses live ets and then not too far away from that is where uh, charles hall said he encountered the tall whites and that's an et race that has also been here for a very long time 
and they have their own underground civilization. So inner earth could mean a lot of different things, but I think collectively it is some of these uh, civilizations that can exist within the earth itself. Maybe some of them have a, a connection with our deep underground military bases, these dumbs, over 130 in this country. And that's uh, alternative two. That's also one of the chapters in Beyond Esoteric. And in Future Esoteric, I have a whole chapter about the military underground bases. And this is part of this big question about who are these extraterrestrials? What is their reason for being here? And what is their agenda? Well, look, they're just like humans. They want to live. They want to exist. They want to go about their business. And sometimes they don't want us to know where they're at or to know how to get down in there. And that's why many times, including Mount Shasta, the whole northern and western portion of the mountain is a military base. It's cordoned off. You can't go to certain areas around there. And, of course, it's riddled with lava tubes, and there's all kinds of underground features that you can even explore. Um, so that, that that's what's really fascinating when you start to incorporate what Middle Earth could be and who it's inhabited by. And I think that runs the gamut as it does with uh, extraterrestrial species as far as who, what, when, where, and why these entities exist here on Earth. Uh, is there any evidence that you saw that just said, okay, that uh, something's going on? Okay, for me, I'll get into you know, You may not be into this. Pizzagate, right? When I knew there was something more going on than what they thought was when that young man walked in and shot up, and I investigate who yeah. he was and then who his father was and the organization his father worked at and who funded that organization and father work and how he and shot the, the computer exactly on the dot yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that, one lucky shot yeah. right <laughs> and that the funding came from the clinton global initiative so when you yeah. go oh okay this all starts to so that clicked in that oh my god it's real and then like the fact that the pizza place that had the pedophile symbol of the pizza was ran by a guy who worked in the uh stopping of exploiting the federal office of uh you know anti-child exploitation he w he was a lawyer representing uh, uh, uh james alfantis i'm like why is this guy who's running this department represent representing this guy legally and i'm like ah because that and they always have children charities right yeah they're always yeah out there to help and protect but really they're out to exploit yeah it, it's it's dark but did and, you and it can be very disturbing to get into some of this stuff, but I think it needs to come out and be talked about. I don't want to get so much into that because I, I because that is a big issue, but I really want to talk to you about, was there any evidence like that moment that you saw that kind of clicked into you that these underground bases, these, these exo politics was real. Was there something that really clicked with you that goes, okay, this seems to be, I mean, cause we don't, do we know anything for sure? I don't think, I think if you take that, I got to know for sure, you're just going to be uh, battling windmills the rest of your life. But if you're like, anything's possible, this is what I believe. This is why I feel to me is, is the smart way to go for me personally. But was there something that made you feel like, okay, this is definitely something's going on. Well, yeah, uh, seeing it with my own eyes. <laughs> All the way back in 1997, I was backpacking around the Pacific Northwest, and we were up on uh, the highest point of Crater Lake and saw this light coming directly into the depths of Crater Lake, uh, a bright streaking light with no sound, and it broke off into these perfect, perfect square blips. I'll never forget it because it was just so uh, difficult to try to understand. And I still don't understand it. And I witnessed it with several other people. And we all talked about it all night because we couldn't believe what we had seen. But not only that, just within minutes, we saw the same phenomenon over Mount Shasta in the distance. The exact same white streaking light. 
So that was 1997, and that's really what set me off uh, into in exopolitics and, and studying UFOs and extraterrestrials. Since then, I have seen multiple sightings, mostly around volcanoes, uh, including up at the E-City Ranch uh, in Washington State, Mount Adams, just coming and going all night. I mean, if you ever had a doubt, go uh, do a night watch at some of these paranormal hotspots, and you too will see it with your own eyes. And then just studying uh, why so many UFO sightings occur at UFOs and coming to realize that um, it would be a place where these crafts could uh, get energy from the heat of volcanoes to having large cavities within the volcanic uh, body and throat where these crafts could stay out of sight from the surface world. Of course, they would have technology that would transfer them through matter to get into these volcanoes. And then this whole idea of inner earth and, uh, very advanced civilizations living within volcanic uh, areas. So it's just been a, a fascination for me and realizing we don't have to always look to the stars to try to understand uh, the, this alien world. It's right here below our feet in many occasions. And the evidence is these ships coming and going from these volcanoes. What do you think about the TikTok video, the Dr. Frazier and all those? They, is that government propaganda or is that exactly what you're kind of seeing? Yeah, these grainy videos, they're, they're kind of hard to really make heads or tails. But I'll tell you, the, the drip, drip, drip of disclosure has now become a steady stream. And the, the little Dutch boy can't keep his finger in the dike for too much longer. I mean, it is just, <laughs> it seems like every day we're getting new videos or verifications or admissions from the Pentagon that these videos are real. So rather than just uh, getting caught up in the minutia, let's just look at the big picture here and just see that there's so much coming out right now that you really would have to have your head buried in the sand to not put it all together and say, yeah, of course we've been visited. And of course, the government and military knows about it and they're studying it. Look, if you don't know what something is and it's a potential threat, of course you're going to make it top secret. Of course you're going to take crash retrievals and backward engineer it and try to understand what kind of technology is it. It makes perfect sense that the government would react in the way it did in the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies up till now to try to keep a lid on this. It's in the national interest to uh, keep this a secret, to have the NSA spin a story if, if there have been a lot of uh, sightings. But look, there, there's a volcano just outside of Mexico City that literally millions of people have witnessed craft coming and going, including large cigar-shaped craft coming in and out. And the fact that it's an active volcano and occasionally erupts only makes this so much more fascinating that they have technology that is clearly unaffected by molten lava and uh, matter as we know it. So, I mean, if if you're looking at this, you're going to get so many questions about how these crafts can function and operate and who the uh, pilots are that... (laughs) it could fill volumes of books. And that's why I cover it in these esoteric series, because it is very much a select few who have glommed onto these subjects and uh, care to take a shot at explaining what exactly is going on. What do you think is, we've had Greg Carwood on. He's uh, discussed what he's learned from his guest discussing middle earth and he's like anywhere from a complete another another ecosystem with different animals, uh, its own sun, all that stuff. What is your thoughts on what is in Middle Earth? Well, clearly they have some kind of energy source, which could be volcanism harnessed and used in a way that uh, they can produce a light source. 
there's going to be a speaker at the Mount Shasta Summer Conference named Lowell Johnson, who was in Telos last summer. And one of the things he describes is that it's illuminated. You never see a light source, you never see a light bulb or anything like that, but everything is lit up somehow. And that's kind of interesting because in ancient Egypt, when you go into the tombs in the Valley of the Kings or down into some of the pyramids, um, there's never soot from torches. And how would they get down there to carve the petroglyphs and paint them with such precision unless there was some kind of light source? And some of the hieroglyphs in Egypt show them carrying like these giant light bulbs that had some way of illuminating and being powered. So the mysteries of the past combined with the mysteries of of UFOs and exopolitics is really the narrative of this age. This is what I find to be the real zeitgeist of our age that we find ourselves in trying to play catch up and understand how some of these civilizations such as Egypt were so advanced and, and utilize some form of technology that we're still trying to understand how they put these monuments together and uh, what kind of light source they use and so forth that um, these, these are the subjects that I'm very interested in. And that, and that's what I focus on in my books is trying to help people understand that as well. So, you know, the internet, do you think the internet got away from them? Was this all part of their plan? Did they expect that there would be nerd dorks who can't get laid <laughs> that take the internet and, and go and, and it gets away from them? Did it get away yeah. from them? Yeah, it did. Well, Nelson Rockefeller, he famously said, we should have never let the internet get out there. We should have always kept it under uh, the auspices of national security. But there was a decision to allow the Internet to populate. And there was a golden age, I would call it, from uh, the mid-1990s until just a few years ago. When we had the new Library of Alexandria, we had at our fingertips so much information. Now, of course, uh, we have entered this new age of censorship where a lot of these websites and YouTube page uh, videos have been taken down, which is quite a shame because we're starting to lose information. It is a new form of book burning that we're starting to see. And so I was just in a very good position over the last 15 years to start accumulating the information that I put into these books and been able to review videos. And so the, the, the way I do my research is to try to find data points that all connect to the same thing. Um, A good example is the Roswell crash. I wasn't alive then. That was uh, 1947, uh, a full 18 years before I was born. But when you look at, let's put the data points on a bell curve. So there there, there are some authors that will say that they were German, Kraft, uh, or even Japanese Kraft. But it's really those singular authors that say that the far majority of witnesses and testimonies and even the uh, newspaper articles that came out at the time said that there was a crash that was retrieved uh, near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. Um, And then the government went right into cover up mode the day after Roswell is a title of a book by Colonel Corso that said after that, then the whole, disinformation campaign begin. And then on the other end of that bell curve is the government saying, oh, they were crash test dummies and uh, swamp gas or all these cockamamie excuses to say it's anything but what it really was. Because at the top of that bell curve, you have all these data points that suggest that there were alien bodies recovered in these very exotic craft. And of course, they went in to retrieve them, and one of those ETs survived and for a while was getting some information. Great videos by um, Bill Cooper, including his very first one at the UFO uh, Congress, uh, the MUFON in 1989. Grainy black and white video 
that uh, I still watch over and over again because he just came out with so much information from naval intelligence. So put together, then you start to see the big picture here. And that is, of course, there was a concerted cover up to keep this information from the human race. But it was also sequestering quite a bit of technology that had been backward engineered, including zero point energy, free energy, um, so many different technologies that have been sequestered and kept from us that could very well be very beneficial to the human race. And I do think there will come a time in the not too distant future when a lot of this starts to come out. And that's this whole concept of uh, Nasara and Jasara. One of the key points is over 6,000 patents that have been withheld from humanity will be released when um, Nasara Jasara takes place. And this will be a, a reformatting of the financial systems and um, so many other things. So I would just leave it at that and let your listeners uh, do some research into these subjects. But uh, the rollout of this withheld technology is definitely within the purview of how um, humanity will develop with the, the, the wide scope of forbidden technology that has been kept from us. And of course, I cover that in, in my books. Do you foresee uh, a new era coming? Oh, yeah. This is the great awakening. This is how we're able to have this conversation. And as I often say, if I, if I would have heard myself talking about some of these subjects 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't believe myself. But all this information, which is now coming out, is giving us this new perspective to put this together in, in a new way that we can have a new insight into a lot of the information technology that's been withheld from us. Oh, geez, Louise. What about the old guard? What's going to happen to them? The old world order? Well, they're out. They got to be out. I mean, they're holding us back. It's the, the James Elefantes and these, uh, the, the, the cabal is this deep state, which is very well easily verified that they've been in control for a way too long, way too long. And their time is up. They, they got to leave. And it, that's what the Great Awakening is, is recognizing this control grid and dismantling it and putting in a much more fair and judicious way of handling things on Earth. I... I agree. I think something's coming. I mean, even if you take a, you know where there's a lot of great truth knowledge coming out on TikTok. I mean, say whatever you want about that 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 app. And I know we're, I'm a little older than you guys, so but some of my friends are doing really well on it. But man, I get sent videos all the time. TikTok, uh, this conspiracy video, that conspiracy video, this conspiracy video. Word is getting out for you think because uh, they're too short. It's hard to like stop them or too many well, to watch. There's too much that, content to listen, be watched. Dude, the notion, the notion that a small group of people can monitor everybody on the internet all at one time is, is completely ridiculous. No, that's why they're going to AI to, 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 to monitor. Yeah, I still don't think it could be done in real time. There's so many of them. Not us. now. But eventually, what they will do is working on it. down your line. But I, I, I'm like Brad. I have hope for humanity, dude. I think, I think they need to do all this shit. The fact that you saw Joe Biden put out a thing going, "Oh, hey, uh, guess what? Guess how nice we are. If you get a vaccine, you can go out without a mask on." Like I wasn't <laughs> already doing that. Stop giving me green light, red light, old man. I'm doing what I want. <laughs> that's even I'm a free soul. That's even hypocrisy by their own rules because that, every because scientist losing, has dude. every scientist has says that it's safe to go. You can't catch it outside. Nobody's so that tells you even by their own rules, they're hypocrites. They're losing yeah. the war. What's going on is everybody's like, I gotta get it for work. Okay, you go do it. I'm not arguing with you. You gotta pay your bills. Do what you want. Just know the rest of us are holding off. 
And eventually it's going to get to the point where these companies that are like, oh, you got to have a vaccine card to use this. Guess what? You're not going to have a fucking business. If they put the number at 70 million people got uh, the vaccine, let's say, that's not enough to carry the U.S. economy. If it's you're doing not. it, though, because you have to feed your family, do some research on which one you get. And you I'm also saying, there's a difference. And stand your ground. If you're not, don't be going to places that make don't, you take dude. the vaccine. Don't. Stop. Dude, the one thing I can say about the the right that I like more about anything lib, what I don't even think they're liberal. I think the right is more liberal now than the fucking crazy progressive w- left. Is that they will pull all their money out the right? I mean, everybody can hate Q. I say it all the time, but let me tell you something that those people did. They pulled out all their uh, attention, their energy, their money, their time. And you just saw just it go. Just things are just boom. Fucking Coke is backtracking on trying to pull out the baseball game because guess what? All these conservatives are like, I like Pepsi now. And they're drinking Pepsi. It's just what it is, dude. They are really good at saying fuck you and a click you claim. And that was great. Brad, great episode, man. You give me hope, brother. You give me hope. He's got so many books. His website is bradolson.com. The links will be in the description below. Brad, I know we had a little technical difficulties at first, but we came back and dropped the hammer of the gods on him. And uh, I appreciate you joining us, brother. Oh, it was uh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me on. And hey, we should do it again sometime. Brad, open door for you, my friend. I love talking to you. I'll do it all the time. Uh, I'm going to get one of your books and start with that. And then maybe I'll, I'll bang out all 10 sometime. I'm going to try my hardest. <laughs> Which one should I start with? You want me to start with that one? No, start with the new one. Okay. Beyond we about most of the time. I'm yeah. down. Escaping prison planet. All right, man. We're in. Brad, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you, Johnny. I love you, Swarm. I hope to see you in Indianapolis this weekend. We go deep, homeboy. Aaron, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. There's- you just blew my mind. Tim foil hack, Tim foil hack.